We will begin Anatomy Lab 9, the axilla. This corresponds to Grant's, pages 30 through 39 in the Dissector, 15th edition. First, we will identify some of the bony structures. So right here is the clavicle. As you can see, this is the sternocleidomastoid, the clavicular head, and this is the sternocleidomastoid, the sternal head. First, this is the subclavian. So the less subclavian is the last branch of the three major that come off the aortic arch. It will send off the first branch off of the subclavian is the thyrocervical trunk, which has a suprascapular artery coming off and a dorsal scapular artery coming off. Again, thyrocervical trunk giving off a suprascapular and a dorsal scapular branch. And this is just helpful as we move from proximal from the heart to more distal. So the subclavian artery will eventually become the axillary artery, which is the main artery that we need to pay attention to for this dissection. The axillary artery courses posterior to the pec minor or pectoralis minor here. Before it eventually changes names, as it descends into the arm, eventually it will become the brachial artery. It will be named the brachial artery starting at the inferior border of the teres major, which is this muscle here, running with the latissimus dorsi. This makes a lot of sense considering that at this point will be in the arm, so we should probably start calling it the artery of the arm or the brachial artery. Anatomists like to use the pectoralis minor as a landmark to divide the axillary artery into three segments. This is very helpful. Depending on which segment you're in, that's how many branches you would expect to see coming off that segment. What do I mean by this? So before the pec minor, or here, more proximal to the actual heart, is going to be a segment. And then behind the pec minor, so behind this muscle highlighted in blue, will be the second segment. And then distal to the lateral border of the pec minor here is going to be the third segment of the axillary artery. Remember, this is very helpful because the first segment has one branch, the second segment behind the pectoralis minor has two branches, and the third segment, distal to the lateral border of the pectoralis minor, has three branches. So depending on the segment, that tells you how many branches you need to look for coming off of that particular part of the axillary artery. So let's look at the first part. We will remove the pectoralis minor. So in the first part, remember that's before the pec minor, is the superior thoracic artery. The second part, which sits directly behind the pec minor, has two branches. The first one that we need to examine is the thoracocromial artery. This is named so because it sends vessels, such as this one and this, to the thorax, and it also sends vessels towards the acromion, so back this direction. Also, in the second segment of the axillary artery is the lateral thoracic artery. So again, we have the superior thoracic artery that was coming off the first segment, and now we have a lateral thoracic artery. This is a very large caliber vessel. The third part of the axillary artery, or the third segment, has three branches, which is very convenient again. Three and three. So here, the first one is the subscapular artery. As you can see, it runs posteriorly with the subscapularis muscle. Hence the name, and that's the muscle it supplies. Here is the anterior circumflex artery of the humeral head, and this is the posterior circumflex artery of the humeral head. These are named because they make a circumferential loop around the humerus. Notice how all of the names of the branches off the axillary artery tell you exactly where they're going. We start back with the superior thoracic coming off the first segment. It's going to supply the superior thorax. The thoracoacromial artery has branches that go towards the thorax and towards the acromion. There are four branches total. The first one here is the clavicular branch. It runs directly above the first rib, which is here, and below the clavicle. That's a great way to remember that it's the clavicular branch. There is also a pectoral branch, which supplies the pectoral muscles, a deltoid branch that obviously supplies the deltoid region, and an acromial branch. In the second segment, as you can see, the lateral thoracic artery runs down the thorax on the lateral border of the pectoralis minor. Very easy to understand why they probably named this the lateral thoracic artery. So now on to the third part of the axillary artery to further examine the three branches that come off. So we already discussed the subscapular artery and it descends along the subscapularis muscle. The anterior and posterior circumflex artery of the humeral head will loop around to unite passing through this space here. This space is called the quadrangular space, named so because it kind of looks like a quadrilateral. This is a very high yield space because the posterior circumflex artery of the humeral head will come off the axillary and pass backward with the axillary nerve through this quadrangular space. The boundaries of this quadrangular space, the boundaries of the quadrangular space are the teres major below the teres minor above, the humerus laterally, and the long head of the triceps brachii medially. The anterior circumflex artery of the humeral head will meet up with the posterior circumflex artery of the humeral head 
but first it must pass deep to the coracoid brachialis and biceps brachii to run directly on top of the humerus. You can see it is hugging the humerus very tightly here. All right, we will resume with the anatomy lab, the axilla. We've covered the blood supply. Now let's move on to the more complex arrangement of the brachial plexus. This is a classic favorite. It will absolutely show up on your exams and step one. Particularly a lot of the palsies like Herb Duchenne palsy that are associated with shoulder dystocia in birth. So the brachial plexus is just a plexus of nerves formed by the anterior rami that leave the vertebral column above the transverse processes. So here we have rotate our image. For example, here, this is C8. You can see the many roots coming together and forming one ventral nerve root right above the first thoracic vertebra. It's important to note that there's a transition here. And when I mean transition, I mean that the vertebra that corresponds to the nerve root will switch when we transition from the cervical spine to the thoracic spine. And this is just a way that it was named. So here is C7, and you can see here above C7, right above is the ventral spinal ramus of the seventh cervical root. On the other hand, we see here that the first thoracic vertebra is now going to have the first thoracic ventral spinal ramus coming out below it. So again, here's T1, the first thoracic vertebra, and here is the ventral spinal ramus that is forming T1. So that's very high yield. You gotta know that. C7 or more superior in the spinal column, you expect the root to come out above the transverse process of the corresponding vertebra. When we transition from cervical to thoracic spine, it's gonna switch when you have the corresponding ramus coming out below whichever thoracic vertebra we're talking about. And it will continue that way the rest of the spine. So the classic mnemonic for memorizing the organization of the brachial plexus into roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches is Randy Travis drinks cold beer. Let's begin with Randy or the roots at the most superior root, which is C5. Here is C5. It is coming out above the C5 cervical vertebra. Before we move on to the next trunk, we can see that there is a branch coming off of C5. The dorsal scapular nerve, it is a very high yield nerve because it is one of the few that comes off of a root. So this dorsal scapular nerve is named so because it obviously travels here on the dorsal surface of the scapula. It innervates the rhomboids that would be sitting in this area here. Also coming off C5 with some contribution from C6 is the suprascapular nerve. This is the suprascapular nerve, and as we can see, it is named so because of the course that it will take. The suprascapular nerve runs directly over the surface of the serratus anterior, and it is named because it runs through the suprascapular notch here of the scapula. In addition, it also runs on the dorsal surface of the scapula after it passes through the notch. It is going to supply the muscle in this region in addition to the muscle here. So it will be supplying the supraspinatus, sending also a branch here after it passes through the suprascapular notch to innervate the infraspinatus. I left some of these other nerves on here to highlight them, for example. Here we have the phrenic nerve. Remember it is composed of C3, C4, C5, so there are branches coming off of C5. Next up is the long thoracic nerve. It is also coming off of C5, but what is unique is that it has contributions from not only C5 and C6, but also C7. So C5, C6, and C7 form the long thoracic nerve. We can see that the long thoracic nerve courses down on the surface of the serratus anterior, which is very convenient because this is the muscle that innervates. And classic lesion to the long thoracic nerve results in a winged scapula because the serratus anterior is responsible for keeping the scapula along the thoracic posterior wall. Okay, great. Now remember, we're still talking about the roots. Remember that C5 and C6 come together to form a trunk. And this is a common theme for the rest of the brachial plexus, where the eighth cervical ventral spinal ramus, or C8, will be joined by T1, which is the first thoracic ventral spinal ramus. So here, you see a C8 and T1 come together to form the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. What is very unique is that C7 continues by itself to form the middle trunk of the brachial plexus. So quick review, C5, C6 come together and make the upper trunk. Off of C5, we have the dorsal scapular nerve. Off of C5, with contributions from C6 and C7, we have the long thoracic nerve. C7 continues by itself to make the middle trunk. C8 and T1 come together to make the lower trunk. In addition, there's another nerve not shown from the upper trunk called the nerve to the subclavius muscle. Obviously, this innervates the subclavius. I'm going to share with you a concept 
that made my life a lot easier when I finally learned it. All of the trunks divide into anterior and posterior divisions. So there are three trunks, which means that there will be three anterior and three posterior divisions. All of the anterior divisions generally supply the anterior part of the arm and forearm, while all of the posterior divisions supply the posterior compartments of the arm and forearm. So basically, if you have a muscle on the back side of your arm and you can't remember what it is, let's say it's the triceps, a good guess would be to think about any nerve that is derived from the posterior divisions. So the posterior cord is named that way, as we have selected it here, because it runs posterior to the axillary artery. In addition, you can see that the lateral cord is lateral to the axillary artery and the medial cord is medial to the axillary artery. A very convenient way for identifying them on dissection. The posterior cord, again, was formed by the posterior divisions of all of the trunks. So upper, middle, and lower all contribute a posterior division to form the posterior cord that runs posteriorly to the axillary artery. It innervates muscles of the posterior compartment of the arm and forearm and also the deltoid. A mnemonic for the branches of the posterior cord is ULTRA, U-L-T-R-A. So let's examine the contributions to this mnemonic. So again, the posterior cord is formed by the posterior divisions of all of the trunks. So the upper, middle, and lower trunk all contribute and break off an anterior and posterior division. They all send their only posterior division to create the posterior cord. It is very convenient. Once again, the posterior cord is posterior to the axillary artery. It is formed by all the posterior division, and it controls the innervation to the posterior compartment of the arm and forearm. So the mnemonic, ULTRA, is only helpful if we can actually identify the components of the mnemonic. So let's examine the subscapular nerves first. The U is for the upper or superior subscapular nerve. The T, the T is for the thoracodorsal nerve. This is also called the middle subscapular nerve. The lower subscapular nerve should be running in this orientation here, as I'm drawing with the mouse cursor, but for some reason it is not shown on this model. All of these nerves derive their name because they're running on the, on the under surface of the scapula, therefore subscapular was the way that they were named. So again, there's three, upper, middle, also called the thoracodorsal, and the lower. They supply the subscapularis muscle and the teres major. The thoracodorsal nerve is very high yield because it is at very high risk for injury in mastectomy. The thoracodorsal nerve passes along the lateral border of the subscapularis muscle. So the subscapularis muscle will be sitting here on the scapula and the thoracodorsal nerve will be descending here. Notice how subscapular artery and the lateral thoracic artery are also in this region. So the thoracodorsal nerve will be running along with the subscapular and thoracodorsal or lateral thoracic artery. Now let's fill in the rest of our mnemonic. So again, we have the posterior cord highlighted here in blue. The R in our mnemonic is for radial. The radial nerve is a direct continuation of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. As you can see, the blue highlighted posterior cord will continue and become the radial nerve. The radial nerve will pass through the quadrangular space. It's difficult to visualize, but if we flip around to the posterior side, we can much more easily visualize how the posterior cord will continue and become the radial nerve here. And remember that the radial nerve provides innervation to the skin and muscles of the posterior compartment of the arm. That is why the radial nerve is going to give off a branch called the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm. See how the radial artery is continuing to descend here closer and closer to the humerus where it will join the arteria profunda brachii and run in the radial groove of the humerus. That is why mid-shaft humeral fractures are very dangerous because they can compromise an arterial supply by severing the arterial profunda brachii and also causing some neurological damage by damaging the radial nerve. Now we will continue by viewing the terminal branch of the posterior cord, which is the axillary nerve. I have put up the diagram as a reference point. It is very important that you refer to it in order to understand the arrangement of the nerves. The axillary nerve is going to pass through the quadrangular space with the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Now the axillary nerve is important because it innervates the deltoid and it will give off a very very small posterior branch that will lead to the creation of the upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm. And that makes a lot of sense because it innervates the upper lateral aspect of the skin directly above the deltoid. 
Now let's move on to things formed by the anterior divisions. So the lateral cord is lateral to the axillary artery that has been removed. It is formed by the anterior divisions of the upper and middle trunks. Again, refer to the diagram if you're confused. The super high yield nerve to examine is the lateral pectoral nerve. It supplies the pec major, which will be sitting here on the thoracic wall, but has been removed so that you can see the lateral pectoral nerve. It's very important to understand that the lateral pectoral nerve on the thoracic wall is going to actually be medial to the other pectoral nerve which is the medial pectoral nerve selected here in blue. They are named based on where they are derived from, not where they are on the thoracic wall. This is a great way for test examiners to trick you. The medial pectoral nerve is lateral on the thoracic wall, but it is called medial because it is derived from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. Musculocutaneous nerve is the terminal branch of the lateral cord. So just like the posterior cord had a terminal branch that was the axillary nerve, the lateral cord has a terminal branch that is the musculocutaneous. The musculocutaneous nerve actually travels directly through the coracobrachialis and then between the biceps brachii and the brachialis. So we can see it was coming, it's piercing through the coracobrachialis here and then it's coursing above the brachialis and it, the biceps brachii was removed to visualize this musculocutaneous nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve will terminate to become the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The name is musculocutaneous for a reason. It has a muscular component. It innervates all the muscles of the anterior arm and then becomes a cutaneous nerve that takes control of our sensation on the lateral aspect of our forearm. The lateral cord terminated as the musculocutaneous nerve. It continues with a contribution from the medial cord form the median nerve. This is very, very important. Let's say that one more time. The median nerve is derived from a contribution from the medial cord and the lateral cord. We will talk about this nerve a lot later. So the last cord that we need to discuss is the medial cord. There's a very high yield medial pectoral nerve that comes off the medial cord here. Remember, it is named the medial pectoral nerve because of its origin on the medial cord. There are two very high yield, because they are often overlooked, branches off of the medial cord, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, and this provides cutaneous sensation to the medial aspect of the arm. And then more distally, we have the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. This makes a lot of sense because the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm innervates a more distal aspect of the upper extremity, so therefore you would expect it to branch more distally off of the brachial plexus. Now here, this is the ulnar nerve, and it's going to descend medial to the brachial artery down the upper extremity. The ulnar nerve is a continuation of the medial cord. This nerve is going to be huge when we discuss the hand because it innervates all the muscles except the abductor pollicis brevis, the flexor pollicis brevis, and the lateral two lumbricals. These are all innervated by the median nerve. 